Good evening, and welcome to the Candidate Forum for Minnesota Senate District 44 and Minnesota House Districts 44A and 44B. I'm Linda McLoon, a member of the Roseville Area League of Women Voters and a resident of Roseville, and I will be the moderator for this Meet the Candidates Forum. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, I want to thank you for joining our virtual candidate forum. The League is a nonpartisan volunteer political organization for both women and men, organized at the local, state, and national level to encourage informed and active participation in government. This forum is part of our ongoing voter education efforts to help voters make informed decisions at the upcoming elections. This allows you an opportunity to hear candidates discuss issues that are important to you. There's never enough time to cover all of the issues in a limited time and setting such as this. If your questions are not addressed, we encourage you to contact the candidates directly. We hope that over the course of this program, you will learn more about the candidates, and we hope that if, uh, and, and what they hope to do if elected to serve in the Minnesota House or Senate. While we never endorse a candidate, we are directly involved in shaping the important issues of our community to keep our community strong. And if you're interested in learning how to make a similar impact, I encourage you to visit our website at www.lwvmn.org. Um, I want to remind the viewers that the views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates and not those of the League of Women Voters, and sponsorship of this forum is not an endorsement by the League for any candidate. This year, the citizens of Minnesota Senate District 44 and House Districts 44A and 44B are electing representatives to serve in the Minnesota State Senate and House. All candidates listed on the Minnesota Secretary of State website as registered candidates were invited to participate. We will use uh, questions that were written uh, written questions that were provided in advance uh, for the running of this forum. Only questions that are, can be directed to all candidates will be used, and all questions become the property of the League of Women Voters, where I keep them in my basement locked up in a safe. Answers to the questions similarly need to focus on the questions themselves. A candidate's record may be discussed, but we don't tolerate personal attacks. So now let me introduce the candidates. So for Senate District 44, there are two candidates for one position as state senator from District 44, and they are Tu Zhang and Paul Babin, or Babin, and he unfortunately was unable to make it uh, the candidate for him this evening. There are two candidates for one seat in House District 44A, Alex Pinckney and Peter Fisher. And Peter Fisher is here tonight, and unfortunately Alex Pinckney also what, he had RSVP, but unfortunately has not uh, arrived. And there are three candidates for one seat in House District 44B, T.J. Horthon, Leon Lilly, and William Johnston. Uh, T.J. Uh, Hawthorne will not be present here, and I will read his opening and closing statement. And William Johnston also did not respond that he could uh, attend, but did not send an opening or closing statement to, for me to read. So the order of the uh, event is uh, as follows. All candidates will have two minutes to give an opening statement. Our timekeeper will hold up a sign to show you 30 seconds, and then a stop sign when your time is complete. You can finish your sentence, but I will enforce this rule to make sure we give the same amount of time to each candidate. I will then ask questions with two minutes allowed per response, and I will randomly rotate order with my random grid that I have sitting beside me. At the end of the question period, you will have two minutes for closing statements, which will be given in reverse order from the opening statements. So we're now ready to begin. So we will start with our candidate for state senator from District 44 to Zhang. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Tu Zhang. I'm the candidate for the state senate. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters for putting on this uh, forum for us to discuss the issues and introduce ourselves to our neighbors. And uh, I am running this year for the open state Senate seat for the newly drawn Senate District 44. Uh, looking forward to continue my work as I am current, currently a state representative for 53A. Uh, looking forward to, you know, pushing forward, uh, you know, voter engagement, uh, you know, providing good schools, funding for schools, um, and taking care of our state re natural resources. And I look forward to doing that as the next state senator for Senate District 44. Thank you. Thank you. The next candidates will be representing House District 44A. Um, 
As I indicated, Alex Pickney unfortunately did not show up this evening, but Peter Fisher, if you would do your opening statement, please. Thank you. Good evening, and I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for putting this on tonight and thank people for taking the time to watch our event this evening. Uh, a little bit about myself. I was raised here in the Maypoint area. I settled here with my family where my kids went to school at our local schools. I had uh, one son who is active in the White Bear Fire Department, currently serves as a captain, fire paramedic in Cottage Grove Fire Department. I have a daughter who is a uh, working at one of our businesses here in Maypoint area as a geotech engineer and another daughter who is a probationary officer in Hennepin County. Um, one of the reasons I ran was uh, years ago, I was, and still am, I work at a nonprofit serving youth who are homeless. And years ago, one of the things I saw so often is that when we don't have the resources for the children out there, they're not able to be successful. And when those resources are provided, our kids are able to be successful, become stable, and do a great job in society going forward. One of the other reasons I ran was because I wanted to make sure that we brought respect back into the process, make sure that we're working across party lines to get things done. And I want to say I did a very good job of that. This past two years, I chaired the Behavioral Health Division. Every bill that came out of my division had 100% support of Republicans and Democrats when it left my division. Most of those bills became law at the end of the day because we worked together to figure out how do we help somebody who's having a mental health crisis because our mental health system is not built out. And so we did a great job of pulling things together to make it happen. Besides having a concern about the mental health issues, I'm very strong on the environment to make sure that we are protecting people from whether it's companies who are polluting the area as Water Gremlin did up in the White Bear area of my district when I had that, or if it's in terms of water sustainability going forward. And then finally, it was making sure that we're properly funding education so that as our children come out of the schools, they're ready for the jobs of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, we have three candidates running for House, the seat in House District 44B. The first candidate uh, cannot be here this evening, and he did send an opening statement, which I will read. And this is from T.J. Horthon. Good evening to all listening and watching. I want to begin by thanking the League of Women Voters for allowing me to submit this statement in my absence. I'm grateful for this opportunity to be heard by the voters. I'm running to represent District 44B because this is where I live, and this is where I've lived nearly my entire life. I graduated from North High in 1998 and left for Navy boot camp in May of 2001. I now work for a small company that was founded in North St. Paul. We are a small firm that does big work locally and all over the world. I have experience working not only with the local city governments of Oakdale, Lake Elmo, Stillwater, Cottage Grove, and many others, but also with the federal government as a military contractor. I've traveled extensively for the past 15 years and been very fortunate to have experienced life in areas that we as Americans certainly take for granted. I think there are better things to do than run for office, but the last two years have shown me that our state government has too much control over how our small businesses are allowed to operate. I would like to begin rolling back state regulations that hold back small businesses. I can't stand by and do nothing when our state legislature passes all of their responsibilities to the governor, causing quite a lot of division, not to mention loss of lifelong dreams all because bureaucrats thought it was safer to be locked down than to take personal responsibility. School choice is another issue I think the state needs to address. By address, I mean let go. By let go, I mean get the government out of schools. I would love to discuss ideas of free market education uh, that ends with best outcomes, better educated youth, and better pay for good educators. If we all claim to hold teachers in regard that we do, they should be earning they should be earning our money like a professional athlete does, but society just expects the state to provide this quality education for free. And finally, regulate cannabis and hemp like we regulate onions. This is the opening statement of T.J. Horthon. We will now have the opening statement for the second candidate for House District 44B, Leon Lilly. Thank you, uh, Linda, and uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters for putting this on. Um, my name is Leon Lilly, and I'm running for election for uh, House District uh, 44B, which is uh, Oakdale, uh, all of it, and uh, parts of North St. Paul, and all of Landfall, and Pine Springs, and then uh, a bit of Maplewood. So it's, uh, I've been lucky enough to serve in the legislature for a few years, and it's my honor to, to do that, and I'm uh, 
um, hoping to, to continue to work for the area. Um, you know, I'm pretty proud of the work that we've been able to do, especially the, the three of us at this table. I think uh, I've worked really well together for our local area and uh, fought hard on, uh, you know, we um, had great things in the bonding bill. Uh, for example, the Tubman Center here locally would have been in there, some sound walls, there were some tax provisions for Oakdale. There was all sorts of things in the, going on in the legislature that uh, did not pass uh, this year, unfortunately, and uh, um, at the end, And but there was a lot of good things that we were able to do. Uh, some of the work that we've been able to do in the last couple of years that I'm really proud of, Minnesota has a AAA bond rating. I know that's a little bit wonky to, to talk about, but uh, it's a top rating. So if Minnesota goes out and takes a loan and tries to get money, uh, we have an amazing bond rating, so we're able to do that. And uh, I'm a big believer in investing in Minnesota, whether that means our college uh, uh, buildings or here locally and trying to build a better Minnesota. But again, it's been my honor to serve this area and our state and uh, hoping to continue to do so. Thank you. The third candidate for House District 44B is William Johnston, and he will not be in attendance this evening, unfortunately. So we're now ready to start questions, and we have some really interesting, meaty questions here. <laughs> So I'm gonna start with the, the biggest one, and that's budget finance. So the 2022 legislative session ended with no action on the remaining $7.2 billion state surplus. What do you believe the state should do with that surplus? And we will start this with Peter Fisher. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, with the surplus that we have is I think there's several ways that we should be taking a look at it. Number one is taking a look at our bonding infrastructure. Uh, with the interest rates, while they're starting to rise, they're still lower than they have historically been, so we should be using more in that area to pay for the repair of the roads and the building infrastructure in our state. Number two, and this is a prime one for me, is making sure that we're continuing to invest in building out our mental health system. That is one of the areas that is very important. We're finding more and more people are overcoming the stigma, and as they overcome stigmas, they're realizing it's okay to reach out for help, but we've never built out the system that's needed to serve them. That will take a lot of time and money to make that occur. Another area is making sure that we're addressing the needs of working families out there, making sure that we have tax breaks out there that will help address them to make sure that they're successful going forward. And then finally, another area that we wanna make sure is addressing the education area. Education these days deals with so many more problems than when I used to be a kid. I see the working in the homeless youth world, the number of our kids that we work with that are still in school also presents challenges to schools. So many of the schools now provides food shelves, they're providing social workers, things that never happened when I was a kid growing up. Uh, these are the type of new things that are out there that if we don't provide the funding for so that if kids don't have a full belly when they come into school or the food to eat, how they're not going to learn. If they don't have stable housing to go home to, it's they're more focused, okay, where am I gonna go after school than they are in trying to learn. So it's really important that we focus in those areas, making sure that we've got education funded and the support services to make sure that our kids will be successful so they've got an open mind and ready to learn when they get to the classroom. Thank you. Uh, next, what should the state do with the $7.2 billion uh, state surplus? And we will have Leon Lilly. Thank you. Um, so it's interesting on these forecasts, um, it appears that the forecast, uh, the surplus is continuing to grow, even though the economy sounds like it's tightening. So it's fascinating. You know, a couple of years ago, the, um, we passed a bill that uh, attacks the wealthiest Minnesotans. And I think that really helped lock down the uh, financial stability in Minnesota. And I'm, I'm really pretty proud of that as a state because uh, the first few years I, I was in the legislature, there was, uh, um, we were in deficit spending. We had about four to $5 billion that were in deficit. Now these last nine years, nine years in a row, it's been a surplus. So yes, I think we are kind of at a point where it's uh, too much. So I, I kind of, I was kind of on board with the, the, lead, the deal that the leaders had at the end, which was uh, um, cutting 4%, you know, whether that be Social Security or cutting taxes or even the, which I supported the Walls check, sending back 
uh, money to folks. Um, I thought that was a good idea. Increased spending, certainly education would be a top priority. Housing, you know, you could, I mean, there's a lot of need. Um, and then, I'm sorry, but I just think it's right to have uh, some money still in reserve. So that would be mine. Uh, I think I've, I've served in deficit spending years and it's horrible. It's bad for our state. And I, uh, I I'm very strongly support uh, continue to have some in reserve. So I guess that would be my, my answer. Thank you. And now to Zhang, our Senate candidate. Yeah. Uh, thank you again. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate we, um, you know, the state couldn't reach a deal on a, on some of the bills that were, uh, we were waiting on for the last minute at the end of session. But, um, you know, like what Peter and what uh, Leon had said, um, you know, we were, I, for me, I would like to invest in education, our special education funding, the second uh, English as a second language uh, funding that we have, the cross subsidies for those programming. I think that's a need that we, that's not just going to go away and it's impacting students that are going through so much right now, especially as we're coming back from recovering from the pandemic. And so all the students that were impacted, I think those were uh, some programs that I wish we had uh, provided uh, more funding to. Uh, and of course, housing, there's you know, a shortage of housing uh, on all levels, single family, multi units, uh, housing for everyone. And then uh, one, one thing that I agree with Leon is that some of the deals that we got the Republicans to Republicans and Democrats to agree on, I think it would have been great to see those go through, like you know, removing the tax taxes on the Social Security for seniors. We were all on board with it. I think it was something that uh, was a missed opportunity. But we're looking forward to going back to the Capitol and getting the work done next next year, and uh, looking forward to earning your votes. Thank you very much. So this next question will start with Leon Lilly. Many, and this it relates to public safety. Many are concerned about increasing gun violence in our communities. What legislation, if any, would you support to help reverse this current trend and respond to the need for safer communities? So it's a, it's a very good question. It's very timely. Uh, um, you know, clearly we, uh, you know, we tried to uh, pass some common sense uh, uh, gun safety um, uh, provisions in the House, and quite honestly, we were met with uh, strong opposition. And uh, a lot of it's, you know, really, I mean, even the gun folks nationally would, you know, aren't offended by some of the stuff that we were trying to pass. And it just made a lot of sense to do that. And I think, uh, you know, we're going to have to figure this out moving forward. It's it's certainly a challenge. Um, you know, on my, you know, on my way in, I stopped and you know for a second, and uh, you know we've we've lost police officers in this community too, and uh, I think they're part of the solution. You know, for me to to you know we need good officers. Clearly, what happened in Minneapolis with the uh, you know, there with Mr. Floyd was wrong. Um, we know that. I mean, you can just see it. It's re repulsive and just, it's just vile. But, uh, you know, we, you know, we, I look out there and I see uh, Mr. Bergeron and Crittenden. And, and uh, so I know that uh, I knew both of them personally. And, uh, you know, we need to do a good job. I think there is a lot that can be done. Um, you know, I watch the news just like everybody else. I, I grew up in the media business, and uh, I just uh, I just think that uh, you know we as a community need to keep an eye on each other and work together better. But certainly partnering with uh, good law enforcement and just uh, hoping that uh, we we work with people and just realize how bad it really is uh, out there right now on some of these public safety issues and to respect that and and not not run away from it to face the, the real issues and and challenges of the time thank you to Zhang. No, thank you for your question um you know when i first ran in 2018 for the legislature uh, you know, we made a really strong push trying to uh, address, you know, gun violence here in our state. Uh, you know, I signed on to the red flag laws, 
you know, trying to put a ban on, you know, uh, AR-15s and funding for mental health programming because that, that, I think that's also a part of the, the issue that uh, we've been facing not just here in our state but in our country uh, addressing mental health issues. Uh, the access to some of these weapons that, you know, you can shoot up a whole school uh, within five minutes, right? And so, uh, you know, those were some legislations that I signed on and unfortunately we weren't able to get those passed, but I contend to continue working on that. I uh, worked on it in the House and now I, I intend to work on it in the Senate and hopefully we'll get them through the finish line this time. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Peter Fisher. Thank you. Gun violence is an issue, and there are many causes of it. I think some of the first things is that guns are just very easy for people to get a hold of, whether they should legally have them or not. Uh, having worked in the homeless youth world, I've seen how easy it is for uh, people in different areas to be able to find guns and get a hold of guns. And one of the reasons that happens is because a lot of the youth, and this is where a lot of shootings are happening, it's young people, is because they're scared. They're out in the world and they're scared. They're scared of what's going to happen to them. So they get a gun to defend themselves. As our Constitution says, you, you, know, you should be able to use a gun to defend yourselves. The problem is they haven't been taught what is proper gun safety. One of the things I support is making sure people have access to proper gun safety as part of a curriculum, as I know that there have been programs in some of our schools in the past where they've done archery, they've done gun safety, et cetera. Making sure that we've got red flag laws out there, a bill that I signed on to. Making sure that we're closing the background loophole check uh, out there. Let's make sure everyone who's gonna have a gun is ha has that uh, 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 check being done. And then finally is taking a look, as I mentioned before about the youth. If the youth are finding safe, finding ways for them to more properly address the issues when they're angry, when they're upset, or when they're plain scared. And that's gonna take a lot of work because if you've got youth out there who don't feel safe, and they're not feeling safe in our community because of lack of police or because of other people in the community. We have to teach them how to, how to feel safe, how to be able to develop that. Also, what are better ways to interact in terms of when you are angry, how do you properly interact? What are diversion programs that we have out there so that we can start building the programs for kids to be in so that they're not out on the streets but be able to do recreation, arts, these kind of programs that years ago when I was a kid we used to have access to are not as readily accessible now. So these are the type of things to find things for kids and students to get out of school. The more they interact and work with each other, the more safer they feel and less threatened they feel by others because they know the people. Thank you. This next question, we'll start with Peter Fisher. No rest. So, and basically, there's a little bit of overlap here. Should the state invest in more mental health resources? And if so, how should that be done? Um, thank you for that question. Uh, as chair of the Behavioral Health Division, and as I said in my opening statement, this is one of the biggest things that we need to do is invest more in. And there's many different areas that we have to do a better job is, is number one, we don't have enough uh, beds built out there so that when somebody is done with the hospital stay, the next step that they need to go to has not been fully built out. So as a result, we need to provide money out there so the services are there. So that would be going from a hospital to maybe a Ertz, uh, 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 Ertz resident facility where they can receive treatment in there. Making sure that we've got enough clinicians across the state to be able to address people out there. Some examples I want to say first of all is I was honored to be chair or not chair but as a person that was tasked to come up with the mental health bill that we had at the end of session. One of the most humbling things I've been involved with and some of the things that we did in there that we need to do more of is providing grants out there so that people who are going to be doing this work in the future have grants to pay for supervision. Right now only 40% of the people who start the process to be licensed to be able to provide behavioral health services don't make it to the end because some of the things they have to do is they have to pay for their service for supervision services that can cost thousands of dollars out of their own pocket. They have to go through a very long process of to become certified where they have to have supervision for many, many years. So these are some things that we have to tighten up. Making sure that we're providing mental health services in shelter-based locations. That's something that we increased this past year. One of the big things that we did based on input from our local county attorneys, et cetera, was to be able to build out a competency system so that when somebody isn't competent to stand for trial, 
the way it was is that people were just released on the streets. They didn't have anywhere to go that was appropriate for them, is to build out that part of the system so that when they're coming out and not being able to be held in jail, they can go into a locked facility to receive treatment and be able to continue getting the services that they need so that they can end up being going through the court system. You know, so there's there's many things. I'm gonna stop there because I could spend an easy half hour just going through all the different things that need to be done. <laughs> Thank you. Next to Zhang. Well, thank you, Peter, for a review of the programming that that's needed to be done in here in this state. Uh, but in the Senate, you know, um, in the House, I served on the Judiciary Committee, but I look forward to continuing on in some capacity in some sort of the Judiciary Committee or whatever uh, form it may take in the Senate. Uh, but I think our uh, mental health impacts, you know, how... Um, you know, how our judicial system is set up, how the court system is set up, how supervision uh, is being implemented, because we're, we don't want folks to be uh, being recycled through a system. We want them to have um, a life. We want them to have hope for the future, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think uh, what we can do through the court system or ju the judicial system is putting in place uh, something that can help people transition, those that have um, come across the law due to mental health, we can find a way to, uh, you know, re rehabilitate them, reacclimate them into society. And so that's something that I believe I can help contribute uh, to this state and into the Senate, and I look forward to continuing that work. Thank you. Thanks. And finally, Leon Lilly. The mic was on and I turned it off. <laughs> um, yeah, the mental health issue is uh, is a big big issue in the state, and uh, you know we've been lucky to have uh, uh, Peter working on that in the House, and, uh, and with Tu Zhang also in this uh, and the judiciary working on these sort of issues. We've been really blessed in this area. Uh, before early in my career, I, I served with Mindy Greiling, and she's just been an absolute hero on these topics and. Uh, I suggest folks even read her book uh, that she's written about her personal uh, uh, story. But um, she, early in my career, she uh, started a mental health caucus, and she uh, just led us down a great path, the whole legislature, bipartisan uh, effort, Senate, House, and it was just a room full of people that were really concerned. And it's sad to me that these issues continue to grow and continue to go on. Um, you know, in our schools, uh, we we had a, a budget that uh, came forth out of our education committee. Half our budget, just so folks know, goes about to uh, just about goes to education. It's the biggest budget item because obviously we want our kids doing well to to succeed, to have success. I mean, look down over street to 3M. I mean, it's not. You know, we've had all these great scientists and researchers, and that's you know, I just think that's so important. But the mental health is uh, so important. We had a 400. $75 million proposal that didn't, uh, wasn't the Senate wasn't open to. And, uh, you know, if you turn it, survey kids, uh, a lot of them are really struggling. And, uh, and the teachers, they say their number one issue is uh, uh, taking care of kids that are struggling and also taking care of themselves, kind of meeting the times. And so we, we need to do a better job as a state, uh, clearly, and to reach out. We, have, uh, we horribly fail with our counselors in our state. And again, we could continue talking about these things. So thank you. Very good, thank you. Uh, we'll start this next question with Tu Zhang. Uh, it's a little long, so if you need me to reread it, let me know. Uh, so what does equity mean to you? Where do you feel Minnesota has made progress with regards to equity? And where do you feel progress still needs to be made? And where do you fall in this continuum? Yeah, uh, so for me, uh, equity means everybody gets an opportunity. Uh, I think that's something that, uh, you know, pushed me to, to run for office in the first place, running for city council eight years ago. Um, I think many, we are a very diverse state, a very diverse country, uh, many coming to this country at different points in time, many having gone through different life and lived experiences. And so um, we're, we're, we wanna be a state and a society that uh, lives up to the American dream, one that you know, everybody has the opportunity to succeed 
And so I think that goes into what, how mm -hmm. all of us at the legislature try to uh, commit to in, in how we formulate our policy. We want to make sure that, you know, education, everybody can receive a quality education, not just based on your zip code or, you know, how much your parents make or how much you can afford. We want everybody to have the opportunity to, to get the best education possible, the best health care possible. And that's what I try to do as a state as a state representative. And that's what I hope to continue doing uh, as a state senator. Um, some progress that I have seen us uh, make here in this state is that we are intentional, intentional in how we try to address those issues from very simple things like in city council meetings or our own meetings at the state capitol. I know uh, Leon and Peter are chairs and they try to be intentional about having discussions about equity and about the racial disparities that we have in this country. And so uh, that's something that I, I'm hopeful for and we of, of course need to do more work as we see throughout our country this uh, today. And so I look forward to continuing the, the discussion and pushing forward, um, you know, the closing the gender gap and raci closing racial disparities. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Next, Peter Fisher. Thank you. What equity means to me is for everybody to have the same opportunity to be successful going forward. And it doesn't happen right now. And some of the issues, some of the examples I'll use is that too often things are built into a system that in the area of employment, when you've got generic people put up against each other, not in person, but just their resumes, it's been found that when a African American male applies for a job, a white male with a criminal record will get hired, usually before the black African American male without a record. They find the same disparities in housing. They find the same kind of disparities in wages that are paid. They find the same kind of disparities even in terms of applying for loans. These are some of the problems. In some areas of our state, you will find more, you won't find banks. What you'll find is you'll find the opportunities for uh, payday lenders, pawn shops, etc. And the banks are usually in the areas where supposedly people are saying, oh, this is where is more uh, wealth or more people who are white. These are the disparities out there. It's not that these areas are any less safe, it's just some of the things that are reality. So if we wanna talk about equity, we need to talk about the work that we need to do in the system to make this change. And some of that comes down also in a cultural way, and I'll, I'm gonna pivot real quick in the mental health area. In the mental health area, in some cultures, being able to talk about mental health is very easy. In some communities, it isn't. What I have found working with our youth or homeless, when they've got people who provide the services that look like them, they're much more willing to receive those services in the mental health area. And so what we need to do is make sure that we're training people so that we've got a wide, diverse crew coming out that is trained to help provide those services. The same thing happens in the medical world. People feel much more comfortable who are uh, people of color going and seeking services from those who look like them. And the outcomes are much more successful. And those are just a couple of examples. Thank you very much. And Leon Lilly. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm glad Tu Zhang um, started off with saying kind of what happened in the legislature this year with uh, uh, really being intentional. Because I think that's really what happened in the Minnesota House. And I think uh, our speaker led us down a path uh, that uh, you know really challenged all of us to to really do a better job of uh, asking these questions, and so I was lucky enough to be chair of the legacy committee, and uh, and so in all areas of the funds, and we you know we have about eight hundred million dollars that is raised uh, through the legacy funds. We we tried to focus every hearing on uh, you know how are we doing. We checked in you know with uh, every group that received money throughout the state every you know whether that's you know there's equity work that can be done in all areas it's amazing uh when you start thinking about it because think about like an environmental area um water that's not clean water you know i mean the legacy amendment was basically i think really helped by you know a lot of one third of the money goes to clean water well a lot of our poor neighbors in our state uh don't have clean water i mean we're not too i mean we are better than michigan but we've got bad areas 
and we need to face that and so we've done that some lead pipe stuff and then as a legislature we've kind of done this so there's a lot of equity the work that can be done in the arts community uh, uh, we really tried to focus on that I started uh, uh, different uh, funds in the committee that go to uh, uh, different communities uh, to our african-american neighbors um, and Africans and Native American and to our Hmong neighbors and other Asian communities and uh, our Hispanic neighbors. So we started this because uh, we wanted to be certain that they could kind of navigate and lead on those uh, themselves. So it's a Hispanic group that would say where the money goes in the Hispanic community instead of maybe the Ordway deciding uh, where that money would go. So we were very intentionally worked hard on this issue. Thank we you still can you. do more. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to education, and we'll start with Peter Fisher. So I have several questions here. Um, I think I will ask this one. What should the legislature's role be, if any, in determining school curriculum, and what is taught in classrooms without the state, throughout the state? I don't know if I said that right. OK, thank you. Uh, our role is to make sure that we're providing the funding out there and some basic levels of what uh, youth should be able to uh, test out to or be able to have uh, competencies in. I think in terms of the curriculum itself, our state has always had the policy of making sure that each local district is able to figure that out themselves. And for the most part, that works well. The one area that I am concerned that it doesn't, but I haven't been able to figure out the answer or some others I've talked to, is that as we've become a much more mobile society, it's not unusual for children to move from one district to another district throughout the year. And when that happens, they come in at different learning points. Is a district might be teaching, say, in history, they might have started off teaching about, say, the uh, uh, Civil War and then moving on through the process. But if a kid transfers into that district, they may have come from a district where they didn't start out with the Civil War, they may have started off at a different point in history. So as a result, they miss some of that. Same thing happens in the sciences because while they've developed their own curriculum, it's at different path lengths. So for students who are mobile, they start missing out on things in the process. And it's very difficult because while they may be using the same books, they may be using different starting points within the books. And it's trying to figure out how do we do that? I'll have to admit I don't have the answer, but I do know the questions to ask to try to figure out how do we do that? How do we work with our districts to make sure you have some kind of consistency as we move forward to make sure that our kids are getting the same education? Thank you. To Zhang. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Peter hit the nail right on the head there. Uh, you know, we at the at the legislature, we try to keep the spirit of uh, the spirit alive where we let our local communities decide what's best for them. That That's the heart of what uh, we, we try to do, because we know how important the schools are for our own communities, for bringing people together. It's the central location for many people on how they can interact with their community. And so um, that's something that we always try to keep uh, in place. But then again, like what Peter said, we we are, you know, back then they, we said we were trying to train and invest in the world's best workforce. And so if we don't have any sort of baseline to work off, we're, our children are competing against people, not just in Minnesota or other states, but people from all over the world. And we know that all, we want our children to be best prepared as they go and tackle the world. And so we want to make sure that our math, math prog uh, programs are up, uh, are up to standard. We want to make sure that our state is competitive, that, our, that we're scoring good, high, that our students are uh, being uh, active and they have you know, physical education in their curriculum and so stuff like that. And so we're trying to find a balance in, um, you know, utilizing what the best of what the local community has, but also be cognizant that maybe, you know, we, we need some consistency as Peter had said. So thank you. Thank you. And Leon Lilly. Can you repeat the question? Yes. What should the legislature's role be, if any, in determining school curriculum and okay. what is taught in classrooms without the state? I just want to make sure I, I mean, yeah. it was clear from their answers, yeah. but I just wanted to. So um, I, I, uh, 
I got to say that I'm really impressed by our local school district here. They really are doing an amazing job. Um, we've had them come to the legislature and uh, our superintendents incredible and our school board and the teachers here are really there uh, uh, and those aren't just words they're actually overachieving statistics uh, you know often we hear in the media that some of our kids are struggling in the minority community and here that our minority kids are doing better are they you know are they over the top i mean are we still behind but no i mean there is still some problems but they're really doing a good job i uh i often struggle with this because uh sometimes i think legislators and everybody in politics we think we're smarter than other people but uh um you know i I happen to agree with what uh, two, you know, two just said. You know, there's, I, I would like to see a little more physical fitness. I think that you know the kids are under extreme stress, and I think there's such a push, you know, every second to get uh, all these academic achievements, which is a, you know, I have a PhD chemist son, so I get it. But it's, you know, I, I also want to see them run. I want them to blow off some steam. And I think it's just so healthy. And, you know, I, I want kids to know how to, to eat. I'm, I'm just a pure believer in a liberal arts education. And I just want to see that for everyone. And so as a state policymaker, I guess I do uh, give a little bit of pushback on some of our local school boards. And, uh, you know, when, you know, it's a mixed blessing, you know, if the state gets involved because you don't want to make mistakes. And uh, um, but I, I certainly don't want kids taking tests all the time and that sort of thing. But uh, I I guess I uh, I I don't really answer the question totally. Um, I think it's a hybrid answer that I have ultimately that uh, I think of working with the schools locally and also the state. Uh, but I certainly. Uh, I, I think kids are so important. Thank you. So uh, the next question is, uh, we'll start with Leon Lilly. Sure. And we're going to look at the littler kids. Uh, the what kids? Would you support increasing, oh. the, Leon Lilly, so, uh, would you support increasing the state's investment in early childhood education? Why or why not? So, um, you know, earlier I mentioned Mundy Greiling about uh, being great on mental health. We also had Nora Slavic, a former mayor of Maplewood here, that was a great leader uh, on early childhood, and uh, Senator Uyghur, and I know Tu Jung is going to take over and do a great job in the Senate, taking over his seat. Uh, he has already, and I know he'll continue to do that. But um, early childhood is so vital uh, effort. Um, you know, I've been lucky enough to be in a situation where you know we could read to our kids young and um you know trying to get you know we had when we were financially in trouble we had family that helped us um as a young family you know and not everybody has that so having uh, a good housing solid housing uh good food and good education opportunities certainly early on the earlier the better i'm kind of that school if you can and uh again you know not just the physical education being active but uh the arts i mean it's amazing language skills i mean the kids are just like sponges when they're young that i think you can throw everything at them i mean i i mean uh it's just it's sad to me that uh you know we're missing so much early on and a lot of kids are on the, you know on their phones or pads now and but they can be used as a tool too to you know put good things in there so we need uh, accountability on that and but i definitely support early childhood efforts and uh, and i expect that as a legislature i know we've done it and we will as a democrat caucus we certainly will in the future too sorry thank you uh to jung yeah, um, early childhood education uh, is something that we really need to invest in in this state and in this country. I, I know from talking with folks that have led uh, the efforts in this area for a long time, you know, they tell us that success later on in life is determined by how their education begins. And the earlier that journey can begin, the more the the more successful they can be in their education journey, and I know I've talked with a couple of um, scholarship uh, foundations that you know had talked about you know the applicants that they had to review the students you know from uh, either you know the Hmong community that are coming through that are coming from struggling families, 
you know, they tell us that if only they had gotten to the child a little bit earlier, you know, so much change they, they could, have, could have done. The, the better school they could have gone to, the better ACT score they could have gotten. And so I think early childhood education is something that's really important uh, that we as a, as a state should invest in, should make a commitment in investing in. And, and I look forward to doing that as a state senator. So thank you. And Peter Fisher. Thank you. I, I think both my colleagues here, uh, uh, Representative Lilly and uh, Representative Zong, have done a great job of explaining. I, I do support that we put more investments into early childhood, and I think they've done a great job of explaining why. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, and talk about uh, across the aisle uh, uh, interactions. And I think we've seen uh, in uh, rising antagonism between members of different political parties. And do you think, I guess, is, is this good or bad, the questioner is asking, and what ste steps would you take to increase consensus building between legislators? And we'll start with Tu Zhang. Um, yeah, so the uh, partisanship or the antagonism that we have in politics, I think, um, you know, it certainly has, I, I've certainly seen the changes up front uh, being, you know, involved in politics before we had these things, you know, the phones and social media. I think that has certainly um, brought on an explosion of a, a, a antagonism in how we engage our politics. Um, I think we need to have a space for civil uh, discussions and civil uh, communication and how we engage in politics because that that's why we p elect people for office and not let people you know fight for whoever can have power or make decisions right that's why we have a peaceful democratic voting system in this state that's what the founding fathers created um, and so that's something that I intend on working towards and I know that at, at the other aisle at the other side of the aisle they are just people too. They have values, they have families just like me. And you know, I always go in with that mindset that, hey, you know what, at the end of the day, it's not about the points on the board, but you know, the, the livelihood of the people in our state. And so now that's what I think I've seen what Leon and Peter have done, and that's what I have tried to do, and what I continue to hope to do. Um, one thing I have tried to do to build better relationship with people from the other side of the aisle is just to invite them to my home, to my district. You know, people come from different parts of our state with different experiences or perspective, and so they might not know what it is like to be in Maplewood, or we, we here might not know what it, it is like to live in rural Minnesota. And so we always try to build that personal bond, and so hoped for better uh, political participation. Thank you. Peter Fisher. Thank you. Uh, I think in some ways there is more civility that is starting to happen, and people are aware of it on both sides. And I think that uh, a couple of areas that I can show that I've done a lot of work on is that, first of all, over the last two years, chairing the Behavioral Health Division to have every bill come through my division with 100% support of both parties, come out without a single no vote. That was because we took the time to sit down and talk about each bill as it came through. On a weekly basis, at least a weekly basis, and sometimes a lot more than that, I'd be reaching out to my Republican lead, Keith Frankie, who had approached things the same way. What can we do to build the, the behavioral health system that we need to serve people when they're in crisis? We came together on a common sense issue and were able to get things done and move the ball forward in many ways in the behavioral health area, the mental health area that we have not been able to do in years. Putting hundreds of millions of dollars into the system. Uh, two years ago, another $90 million into the system this past cycle. I mean, to be able to have an omnibus bill that comes out uh, 
most of those bills came, that made up that omnibus bill came through my committee. Uh, it was approved by the Republican Senate and also re approved by the Democratic House. Uh, we did such a good job working together when we were negotiating the bill. It originally started as a $60 million bill, and after we made our case to the Senate, the Senate Republicans said, we'll add an extra $32 million because we know we they, that money out there. And that's about building the relationships, listening to people, and figuring out how do we get things done. And that also involves the work of trying to be very intentional when having the conversations is making sure to choose words carefully because some words will hit somebody's hot button and it's trying to make sure we avoid those words but still make sure that we're getting our point across so that people can understand where we're coming from because once people get emotional it starts spinning out the wrong way so it's trying to figure out how do we keep things in a respectful way and if it's escalating how do we figure out how do we de-escalate the situation so we can have productive conversations thank you and leon lilly uh, thank you. Um, you know, I've, I, I think it's one of the things that, uh, you know, it's not a big secret. I think if anybody watches the news, you can see we're in a polarized times or time. And, uh, you know, what, what you see going on nationally certainly does happen here locally. And it has changed in the last couple of years. Uh, and I, I, I know Representative Fisher Peter was trying to be optimistic, but I, uh, at times I think it has unfortunately gotten a, quite a bit worse during my experience. You know, it used to be early on that you'd go out on the floor and you'd, you'd battle an issue and then you'd kind of go in the retiring room and uh, you'd kind of, you know, have a coffee and talk about your kids. So now, you know, just like society as a whole with COVID, I think it's pushed us farther and farther apart and so we're, we, we have to be uh, aware of that and, and face that. And really, as a state, you know, it's the best to, for Minnesota if we do get along. And I, I've really worked hard at it. I sent, uh, you know, I get along with uh, the Republicans. You know, I, I sit next to uh, Erdahl on the House floor. He's across the aisle, and we talk. Uh, he's the lead on capital investment. And um, Fu Lee's the, the chair now in the House. And we traveled 18 days in a, uh, all over the state of Minnesota uh, just this last year. And then the year before, we traveled. And you spend time on a bus, you get to know each other and, you know, the pluses and minuses and, you know, who snores. No, just kidding. But, uh, um, you know, you get to know each other. And, uh, and I think that's what's important because, uh, you know, we love our area and we're going to work hard to represent it. And that's the same with, uh, with our Republican colleagues or our greater Minnesota colleague, you know, and, uh, and we can all learn from that. And it's better for Minnesota if we get to know each other. Sure, fight for your area, and we're going to do that. And we're all going to fight for things that are important to Maplewood, North St. Paul, and Oakdale, and Pine Springs. But we also need to figure out, you know, that they're doing that and then come out with a product that's great for Minnesota. Thank you. So I'm going to tell our timer that I'm going to do two one-minute questions so that she will be ready. And we're going to start with Leon Lilly. And I just need to, you know, we've been talking about very serious things. So I would like you each to tell uh, the listening audience what you like about District 44. So, Leon Lilly. Okay. So what I like about it is, uh, you know, I... I've been lucky enough to serve in office for a few years here, and I, I think people on both sides of the aisle uh, challenge me. You know, they're not shy. We had a parade uh, coming up Thursday, and I'm, people are going to tease me about something I did in high school or, or something that we did as a Democrat or something the legislature did or even going on in Washington. But at the end of the day, it, I get a lot of people that will vote for me on both sides of the aisle, and uh, they may turn their <laughs> turn their. Uh, <laughs> face but uh, you know I'm really proud of that today was a great day we went to Allen Page school opened up I'm just really proud of our school district and our area and how they're uh, meeting the times and Allen Page was there and they named the school after him and uh, it's it's I think it's a great move for the community but there's a lot of good stuff going on and like I said on that last question we're really proud of this area and it's an honor to serve it thank you Peter Fisher what do you like about district 44 First of all, it's home. This is where I grew up. It's where I raised my family. It's where my, my father grew up. It's where my great-grandparents farmed. Uh, so home always has a special place in a person's heart. I think the next thing is taking a look at the school system that we have here. You know, my kids went to the public school system and it was very, very good for them. They had a lot of opportunities, a lot of opportunities for growth. 
We've got a wonderful parks and trail system, not just in Maplewood. We've got it in Little Canada, in North St. Paul, and the work that the communities are doing across part lines to get things done. I like the way that the communities work together. You take a look at public safety example in the fire area, the fire departments coordinate themselves together so that when there's a major call in one department, all the other area departments show up at that to help address the situation, which makes it much more efficient to take care of the area, and we get that collaboration. And it that, gives that great community feeling because when you're in a crisis, you don't care what city really shows up. You just want to make sure enough people there. And it's a great feeling when you see people from Roseville, from Vadness Sites, Little Canada, showing up to help take care of a fire that's at your neighbor's house. Thank you. And to Jiang, what do you like about District 44? I love the people here. Um, I know that when they were doing the redistricting uh, earlier this year, you know, me, Peter, and Leon, we were always texting each other, talking to each other, like, oh, man, I hope we, get, <laughs> we end up together. And so uh, we're really proud of the, our district, how, uh, you know, we've been door knocking all this, sum this entire summer, great people, uh, good conversations. You know, we come from the similar schools. I was a graduate of Tarn High School. He's from North, <laughs> and we have a little friendly rivalry there. And so I think it, we, we just love the people. I, I really love the people that's here, and I'm looking forward to work with them and uh, get to know them more as we finish out the uh, election <laughs> election cycle this year. Thank you. Okay, we'll do one more one-minute question, and I'm still going to keep it a little light, just to have a little mm -hmm. switch of, of mood, and uh, this is how I get my reading list. And so we'll start with Peter Fisher. What have you been reading lately? Uh, Lord of the Rings, the Tolkien series. I have found that to be a great, great way to escape and, and see what's going on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to Zhao Jing. Oh, I've been uh, reading uh, the the Hero with a Thousand Faces by uh, Joseph Campbell. So it's about like uh, how you uh, t the the hero's story, the hero's arc, and so you know as candidates and as our state, you know, in my speeches I always try to make Minnesota as the hero, right? The long journey that we've gone through, and so it really helps in how you can uh, do your speeches and. I narrate your community story, and so that's something I'm really excited about reading. Thank you, and Leah Lilly. So I've been uh, reading William Kruger's uh, series, uh, Cork, and uh, I didn't know when I started that there's 19 books, so <laughs> that's fun. I'm about uh, number nine, but I'm also, I was waiting for Ramsey County Libraries to give me one of them, so I'm reading Ordinary Grace, which is uh, one of his other books which is a great story, and it's a Minnesota author. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll go back to our two-minute questions, and we'll start this with, well, let's start with Leon Lilly. Uh, we all have gone to the gas station uh, in the last couple months. We have a little bit of a problem with inflation. So how do you uh, propose that the legislature addresses the impact of inflation on Minnesotans. And we'll start again with Leon Lilly. So, um, you know, the I think as a legislature, uh, how we impact that is uh, being conscious of our budgets and uh, being intentional about how it really impacts people and on a daily basis. So if you were to tax something or not, uh, um, you know, what that might mean. And uh, so, like I said earlier, I, um, you know, I, I, to me, I think we should uh, figure out ways to give back some of the surplus, um, whether that be the walls checks that we talked about or a, um, a social security effort uh, to keep uh, some of our seniors whole. Um, certainly, uh, you hate to see a situation where our seniors are being you know, taxed out of their homes. So between the week, work we do as a legislator and some of our legislature and some of our local communities, uh, whether it's the school districts and the counties, so we keep that uh, so the bills are affordable for property owners. And so by doing that, uh, is this a two minute question or a one minute? Mm, two minutes. Okay. So <laughs> inflation is a big is a big issue. It is a big issue. And uh, so by doing this we can be uh, um, aware. I uh, I'm gonna stir the pot a little bit, but I think there's a big fund of revenue that as a state that we're uh, missing out on is uh, by uh, 
legalizing marijuana. I think that uh, um, I think there is some revenue that I would like to see targeted towards education and uh, housing and some other things in our uh, um, makes a lot of sense. Plus, decriminalizing marijuana. Um, that's nothing to do with taxes, but just good common sense. Um, so anyways, that's, uh, I'm sorry to, that'll get some people riled up a little. <laughs> Thank you. To Jean. <laughs> Inflation. Yeah, um, the big issue. Um, you know, given what that we had come out of pand uh, a pandemic um, and, you know, some of the big government programming that we had to put in place because we were trying to address the issue, you know, brought, brought prices up, uh, the supply chain issues that that, you know, the basics of supply and demand. I mean, if something's low in supply, the price of it will go up. And so what we can do uh, here in the state, and I know what we're, we're hoping that the whole country can do is to increase our supply chain, to increase the things that we are making here in Minnesota, what we can do at the state is, uh, you know, the, how we address the tax code, encourage Minnesota-made products, Minnesota-made goods. Um, the transporters that are here, based here in Minnesota, encourage them, and so I think that's something that we can do actively here in this state, make a difference. Um, and that it's to address the supply issue that is contributing to the rise in prices all across the board. And so if we can relieve it in one area, it can help uh, reduce the pressure and, you know, hopefully stop this uh, crazy price increase. Thank you. Yeah, and thank Peter you. Fisher. Thank you. Inflation is a very complicated issue because so much of what causes inflation are things that we don't have a lot of control over. Um, what we do have control over is how do we address the system that we have out there that provides services who are at the lower end, who are in the tight situations, is trying to make sure that we've got the resources out there so that they'll be able to pay their rent, make sure that they're being able to pay their utilities. Those are important things. And it's making sure that we either do that through support services or doing it through adjusting tax rates or a combination of both. And that's what we have to remember. It's the people at the lower end that are gonna suffer the most. And one of the things that also comes into it is realizing that this may be in a long-term issue. And the reason I mention that is I've run into so many businesses where 20 to 30% of their positions are open and we don't have people out there. This is one of the things that's driving it up is people are gonna to have to start paying more for salaries which in some ways is good, that helps raise the lower end. The downside is we still don't have enough people. If you take a look at it right now, unemployment in the state is 1.8%. For every person who's looking for a, for a job, there are two job openings. We have the baby boomers retiring faster than we've got people coming in. What we need to do is figure out how do we bring more people into the system to help do the jobs out there because it's gonna get more challenging because as the baby boomers retire, they need more people providing services as we go forward. And when you take a look at assisted living so that people can stay in their homes, those are supportive services. So we're gonna need more population than we have now. And I think part of the solution is gonna be for the federal government to address how do we address immigration in a way that can bring in people who are looking for the jobs and matching them up with the jobs that are out there. That would start putting, taking some of the pressures off there. It's taking a look at the bigger system. What are some of the underlying problems? That's an underlying problem that the federal government could do that would help us all across the board. Thank you. I think we have time for one or two more questions, so we're gonna go for it. So uh, I, I haven't really d talked about climate and that, <clears throat> that sort of thing, so uh, we'll start with Tu Zhang. Do you believe the state has a role to play in reducing carbon emissions to address the changing climate? And if so, what should the state of Minnesota do? Yeah, it's, um, you know, for, for me, I come from a community that believes, a community and a culture that believes that we are only as strong as the environment in which we grow up in. And so, uh, you know, climate change is a real issue, a real a crisis that's uh, impacting our state, our country, our entire world. Uh, what we can do here in Minnesota, uh, and we do have an important role to answer your question, uh, is that we can 
we can change how we consume things because that impacts of how how much energy energy we are using how what we are releasing out into the environment and so what we can control uh, the you know how we consume energy how we how um, we use use up waste how we uh, what what we give out to the uh, community and to the environment, and so we can start out with you know I'm investing in renewable energy. Um, you know, electrical vehicles is something that I've been supportive of. Uh, you know, providing charging stations throughout our state, and so really tackling how we the people in Minnesota are using up our energy and what uh, how we are impacting our environment. So. Thank you. Peter Fisher. Thank you. I think two did a great job of outlining some of the things that are out there that I am very supportive of. And I want to mention that when we address climate change, we're also addressing another problem that we have in our state is air pollution. Most of what occurs is, uh, is exhaust from vehicles out there and uh, pollution that comes from power plants or from industries. And what we have found, and this is from serving on the Environment Committee for the last 10 years and on Health and Human Services, is that so often some of the worst outcomes that we have for our health is happening in our states and communities where there are high amounts of air pollution coming from the traffic that is in the area. So when we start addressing climate change, that means we have vehicles out there that are running off of uh, electricity that is powered by solar or powered by wind. When you do that, you take out those vehicle emissions. And when you start reducing those vehicle emissions, these areas before that have got high concentrations of pollution. Now the pollution starts going down and now you start getting better health outcomes. The other advantage on that is we found that where most of these communities are that have the high pollution, air pollution, those are also high communities of color. And so you're now just addressing not only air pollution, you're now addressing the issue of disparities in health in, in communities of color. So I see it not just about climate change, but it has the side benefits of addressing other things that will make our state stronger. And so it's important that we address climate change and the other benefits that we get from that is improved air quality and improved health, health outcomes for every Minnesotan. Thank you. And Leon Lilly. So the climate change issue is a, a real issue and we've, uh, we've really, uh, made strides in some areas, and we've fallen short in others. Uh, um, we invested in northern Minnesota in Mount Iron, uh, a solar plant up there, trying to make uh, what uh, Representative uh, uh, Tujong was talking about, uh, you know, investing in Minnesota and getting jobs here. And, and so we've done that as a state, and it's, it's, uh, it's super exciting to have that up there in northern Minnesota and, and you know, working on that. And that's just one example. We've, you know, we've, uh, we've tried to, to do a lot of uh, weatherization on homes. And uh, we've uh, been intentional in that and investing in that and using some federal money to do that and cleaning up, uh, I think I mentioned earlier about the lead pipe issue, that's nothing to do really with clean, with uh, global warming, if you will. But uh, um, the climate changes are real. So I spend most of my time on, uh, on chairing my committee and then uh, on this capital investment committee. We're all on different committees and uh, we all get focused on those areas, but I spend a lot of time on capital investment and uh, we, we spent a lot of time on this. This is a big issue for Minnesota as uh, things change. You know, we have a lot more of these 100 year storms they are coming around every three years or five years. So when you build a dam, when you build a bridge, when you build a uh, road, you've got to, you know, things are changing. So uh, in that area, you've got to be conscious and intentional. And, uh, you know, when you build buildings, you know, to withstand different things or you're putting solar on roofs. And, and so we've really done that. And, uh, and I, I'm really proud of the work that we're doing as a state. The other thing, the plants are changing. So uh, uh, Peter mentioned the environment, you know, the trees that, uh, that might have grown in Minnesota when we were kids are very different now. And so it's changing. You got to be intentional. I do a lot of work with environmental work with legacy. So we're buying for or building forests and rebuilding prairies. Well, the the grasses are different now than they're going to be in a few years. So we got to be intentional about how we're doing that. Sorry. Thank you. That's a. Blah, blah. Thank you. Can we get three minutes? <laughs> 
follow these questions are like an hour. I mean, you know, in fact, you could, you know, <laughs> well, work at the legislature and deal with all of these. Yeah. <laughs> so we are the League of Women expert. Voters. So for my final question, which we'll start with Peter Fisher, I'm going to talk about elections. As a member of the legislature, what measures, if any, would you support to reinforce or ensure voter confidence that our elections are secure and the results are accurate? Uh, first of all, I think a lot of it is going to have to be education. I think that a lot of people that have had concerns out there don't really understand how the system works. And I think the big thing that they need to do is take a look at the nonpartisan groups that are out there that do this work. And at this point, I'm going to call out the League of Women Voters. You've got a group of people who are Democrats, Republicans, Independents, who take great care to take a look at how the elections are done, what is happening, making sure to conduct forums like this to help educate people what's going on. Uh, over the years, they've been out monitoring how the like, you know, actual voting places, taking a look at what's happening there. And I think that's what people need to do, is they need to take a look at where their source of information is and rely on the forces that are more of the, um, what I would call the moderate, the, the, the group where everybody's coming together and checking that out. I think that in terms of the process, one of the things that I have seen a lot of is for people to be able to have the access to be able to vote. And what I mean by that is so often the population that I've worked with over the years is they have schedules that get very chaotic, is they may originally start out not having to work on election day, something happens at work if they're in a restaurant, somebody doesn't show up, or if they're a firefighter and they're missing somebody, they have to call somebody in. And being able to have the opportunity to vote remotely is so important. I think something else that is very interesting while it's controversial is used in our state and that smaller communities are allowed to vote by mail where the ballots are mailed out. And these are areas that are predominantly Republican areas and the smaller communities and they've used it very successfully. I think it's an opportunity to give it a chance for the other parts of our state to be able to use it to make it easier for people to vote. I'd even be open to saying, let's make it a national holiday. Have time off so that people can go and vote. I think that's something that is, uh, get, makes it easier for people to do their civic duty. Thank you. Leon Lilly. So Minnesota is in a, a really a solid position, you know, nationally. I, I, I don't know how much people pay attention to this, but, you know, 2020, we, we led the nation in uh, voter participation. And... Uh, you know, again, if folks are watching the news, there's efforts to, you know, to restrict voting. And uh, thank goodness we haven't. Um, people can vote here. And we've got early voting going on. It's going to be starting in a few days here. People can get out and vote. And I hope they do, whether it's uh, for one of us. I hope it is. But uh, if it isn't, uh, you know, I, I just hope people participate. It's so important because someone's going to make the decisions. Again, I, th you know, I think we're up to the task and would do a good job. But, you know, I hope people participate. It's just a, it's just a minimal participation in this country. I just, it disappoints me so that people, when you hear they don't vote, um, I just, uh, I just really challenge people to get out and uh, pay attention to what we do at local elections and uh, nationally, and uh, participate. But a state, we we really do a good job. Uh, Secretary Simons. Uh, an incredible uh, um, uh, Secretary of State does a good job. You know, I've served on uh, committees that he's come in to testify, and he answers the questions. They were it was a, a GOP chair at the time, and they were asking questions, and he answered them. And the ones he didn't know, he was he came back and he gave good answers and solid and uh, and their facts. And uh, I think we can really be proud of the, of our state. And uh, again, I really hope people participate and uh, and. Uh, and, and vote, and it's so important for our country. Thank you, and to Zhang. Um, yeah, so I, I got involved uh, early on in politics because I was helping to translate for people on you know, how to go vote, why voting is important. Um, you know, when people raise their hand to become a US citizen, one of the questions they get asked is, will you vote, right? And so, uh, it's it's something that's very important and of uh, the fabric of what this country stands for. Um, you know, at the legislature, we've been working with the Secretary of State to put in translators to help. You know, people at the voting booth um, to encourage people to participate. Uh, I think one thing that we we all want to help 
push towards is trying to help get younger, more younger people interested and uh, involved early on in the political process. I think you're more likely to vote if you voted already once. And so trying to tell people, you know, that this, this is what voting is like. It's not as scary as you think. Um, and so that, that's just something that uh, I think we all want to continue to do uh, going forward into the state legislature. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we're now ready for our closing statements, which we'll do in reverse order from the opening statements. And remember, you do have two minutes for your <laughs> concluding remarks. We'll start with the candidates for the House District 44B. And we will start with uh, Leon Lilly. Again, thank you to the League of Women Voters for putting this on this evening. Thank you, Linda, for your, your work. Uh, um, you know, it's an honor to represent this area, and it's it's quite humbling every day. And uh, I, you know, just uh, you know, we each represent as a house member forty some forty some thousand people, and it's uh, it's uh, you know, I, I always say I'm not the necessarily the the smartest guy there, which I know I'm not. You know, we've got, you know, but um, you know, I love our area. I'm very proud of it. It's uh, it's been an honor to serve. I I will continue to. Uh, fight to the best I can and uh, work for our area and our state. Um, I, I've been really blessed to work with Senator Weger and uh, Representative Fisher and uh, uh, Representative Jung, and I know that this partnership that as he goes over to the Senate, I, I think it'll even help us more uh, as with his leadership over there. And uh, I know that we'll be able to do a good job uh, for this area. Um, I am proud of our area, and uh, I'm really uh, proud of our state. We have an amazing state. Uh, I mentioned the triple bond rating, that things, I mean, there's stuff that there's really going on that we can be proud of. I mean, look at our Hmong neighbors that brought us SUNY Lee, huh? I mean, uh, Olympic gold medal, I, if you weren't Amer waving an American flag there, there's something wrong with you. I mean, it's... Uh, that was amazing just uh, to come, her story to come and, you know, choose gymnastics. And, but that's what we want for all our kids. And, uh, and she came, you know, from our area and um, it's, it's a neat story. And we, I, you know, I want all our kids to succeed and our neighbors. And I really, that's why I continue to serve. And I believe in uh, this area in our state. And uh, I'd appreciate uh, if you consider voting for me. So thank you. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Uh, William Johnston is another of the candidates running for that office. He is not here this evening. And I have a closing statement from Trenton or TJ Horthon, who is also running for House Seat 44B. Uh, Mr. Horthon says, thank you again for paying attention and doing your part in finding out who could or should represent you. I am running as a libertarian, and that means I had to work much harder to get onto the ballot than the other two candidates running for District 44B. I would like to change the laws that restrict the access for candidates to get onto our ballots in Minnesota. The two major parties have tightened up the rules so that they both stay in control. This tells me that they aren't much different from each other when it comes to having and standing behind their principles. I'm not a politician, and I believe our representatives should serve and then either move on or go back to contributing to the community. Again, that's the closing statement from T.J. Horthon. So we'll now move to the candidates for House District 44A. Unfortunately, Alex Pinckney could not be here tonight, so we will get a closing statement and did not provide a, a closing statement for me to read. So we will have a closing statement from Peter Fisher. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to once again thank the League of Women Voters, our moderator, for being here tonight to make sure that people have an opportunity to hear from some of us, hear about where we are standing on the issues. I want to thank everybody who's out in the audience today who's watching this and who will be watching in the future. Thank you for taking the time to do this. This is the important work of what makes our Republican democracy work. And it's something that we need to stay committed to. As we go forward, I am from the area. I've been proud to have grown up here, to raise my family here. It's a wonderful area, and I've been honored to serve. I'm looking forward to being able to continue that honor and earning your support. The areas that I will continue to work on is making sure that we're working on uh, providing the funding that we need in education and the services that, so that our children will be ready to have the jobs that will help support them as they grow older. Making sure that we're protecting our environment 
making sure that we've got clean air, clean water, and water that is usable for generations to come in a sustainable way. Making sure that we're taking care of our most vulnerable in society, particularly addressing the issues around uh, those with addiction and those with mental health issues. I see that as being a priority. I've seen great movement over the last 16 years that I've been in the nonprofit world, but there's still much work that needs to be done, and I'm going to commit myself to working on it. And most importantly, I will continue to work in a very respectful way across party lines as I have during my career. Continuing the work, reaching out across party lines as if I have the privilege of being able to chair a committee again, is being able to work with closely with my associates on the other side, finding that common ground that will help move the state of Minnesota forward. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. There are two candidates for the position of state senator from District 44. Paul Babin was not able to be here this evening and did not send a closing statement for me to read. And so we will uh, have the closing statement then from Tu Zhang. Hello again. Uh, my name is Tu Zhang. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much to the League of Women Voters for putting this on and to all the volunteers that had uh, helped make this happen and gave us all the wonderful reminders about when and where to be here. Um, and it's people like you and people in our district that makes, you know, what uh, makes this community great. Um, I hope to earn your vote. Uh, looking forward to continue meeting people door knocking this summer, uh, this continuing fall. Uh, looking forward to uh, talking about the issues and such such as addressing inflation, you know, protecting our environment, uh, making sure that we invest in our local schools and our communities, and bringing a more civic discussion at, at, into the capital, and being intentional about bringing all our diverse community members together. And I know that our uh, our district, uh, the cities within our district, have a tremendous potential. We are the first ring suburbs here. Uh, we are, um, you know, the sky's the limit for our community and it's certainly something that I believe in and I look forward to bringing investments into our community here. Uh, when I was on the city council, we were there to promote our city. We brought in new businesses. We promoted the story of our city and I think it's something that we can do for our district and looking forward to, to a wonderful partnership, hopefully with uh, Leon and Peter uh, to, you know, work not just amongst ourselves, but with the county, with the local cities that we represent here, and uh, continue the great, great work to bring a wonderful community to even greater heights. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. I would like to remind the audience that the views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates and not those of the League of Women Voters, and sponsorship of the forum is not an endorsement by the League for any candidate. I would like to highlight and thank the Voter Service Committee for the Roseville League of Women Voters, especially Teresa Wernicke, who is here working hard all night, and as well as the other volunteers, as well as Kevin, who has stayed late to uh, videotape our candidate forum. I would also like to thank the candidates for their participation in the League of Women Voters sponsored virtual forum. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the candidates who are serving their community by their willingness to participate in the democratic process by running for office. This forum will, will be aired in its entirety on the local public cable channel 16. Uh, it, it will also be on the Maplewood uh, pages on their view on demand. And they are currently scheduled to be run on Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sundays at 7 p.m. starting September 20th, so you can watch it again and again if you would like. So I would, however, check cable channel 16 to make sure that those at times are accurate. I would like to remind everybody, although these days we all know this to be true, every vote does count. So this year, election day is Tuesday, November 8th. If you're voting in person, the polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, please go out, take a neighbor, and vote. Stay well and good night, and thank you very much. <laughs>